Now, normally you'd be seeing Claire stand up now and uh, we'd be receiving our sermon. It's not quite like that today. Claire, as Peter mentioned in his prayers, is, is suffering with her voice. So I've got the job of doing the voiceover. There's still words from Claire, but I'll, I'll do my best and try not to look as if too much like I'm reading it, like I am actually, but anyway. So let's start with a prayer. Lord, be with me now as I try to um, clearly speak Claire's words, a message from your, your word, Lord. Lord, help us to listen to your words, and may we truly have ears to hear. Amen. So, um, we have the reading there from Matthew 13, 10, 17, 34 to 35. And um, if you remember last week, we began our series on Matthew chapter 13, looking at the parables of Jesus. We explored that the parables were used by Jesus as a form of teaching, comparing things to portray a teaching point. And we briefly touched on why, on the why of the parables, as a way of revealing the mysteries of God, but explained that it, that is really what today's passage is about. So, the reason Jesus teaches in parables is connected with kingdom secrets. Now, I wonder if you ever felt like you're missing out on something. <clears throat> that there is a secret, something you don't know about, something hidden from you. Um, it can be like that. I, I'm just thinking, actually, um, I used to work in, with adults with learning disabilities. And uh, one of the things that happened was that we learned some Makatan, some sign language, it's very basic sign language. And after I learned that, I would always use it. Whoever I was speaking to, there was 150 people in the day center, yet two people, just two, apart from having a learning disability, were also deaf. So I just felt that having learned that, that if I kept signing, that those people would feel less left out, that things would be less hidden from them. That's kind of what we're talking. It's a bit like professional jargon. And only those trained in, uh, in those professions. So another l quick example. Um, for about four years, I was lucky enough to work at the Tizard Centre at the University of Kent um, in the Department of Psychology. So I was, I was very lucky because I was employed as an external tutor. So I would just go in as part of, whilst I was working for KCC. But there you would come across so much psychology language, you know, and, and then when we tried to implement things, we'd be using ABCs and MTS. So ABC is a great one because that can mean so many things. Try Googling it. It's, it's very interesting. American Broadcasting Corporation. And if, for the psychologist, it was antecedents behavioral control. MTS was momentary time sampling. In education, um, it would be something like TTO. And that, it, that means what? Term time, I thought there's a parent somewhere, term time only. It was also the same uh, uh, acronym or abbreviation that was used in the world of medicine. But that, in that context, it meant something like um, to take out or to, uh, to take home a prescribed med medication on discharge. So just another example of how, when you, when you hear those acronyms and you don't know that area, then you can feel things are being hidden from you. So it's a bit, again, like uh, understanding a, a foreign language. Um, you know, actually, this is, I think there's another really good quick example, if I may. Um, when I go to Cape Verde, the local language is Portuguese. Now, I'm not very good at Portuguese. I've had some lessons. But by the time I come home and go back next year, I've forgotten it all. But actually, the language that is mainly spoken there is Creole. And Creole is not even, well, as far as I know, is not even a written language. Creole is a language which came from slavery. And it was when the slaves wanted to have their own language to hide things from the masters who they wouldn't necessarily want to know what they were saying. So it would be something like sasson. And what they do is take the vowel out of each word and just use those vowels. So they kind of, and that's kind of how it developed. I mean, it's probably nothing like that at all, but that's what I've... <laughs> That's what I've come to learn. So language can be a, a way of hiding things from people. And, and in a way, it can be a bit like that. 
uh, when, we, when people first enter the church. It can seem like things are hidden. It can seem like things are, you know, I don't know, a mystery, a bit of a mystery. But as we take in God's word, we experience him speaking to us through his Holy Spirit. And as he opens our eyes, things that we at first didn't understand begin to make some sense. Right, I'm not really keeping up on the slides, but I'm guessing we're sort of okay. Okay. Right, the parable of the soils. So I think this was from, well, I know this was from last week's sermon, um, sometimes called the parable of the sores. But the parable of the sores last, uh, was told to a crowd while Jesus was sitting in a boat. He didn't interpret it to them, he just told the parable. It was only later in the chapter that Jesus explains this to his disciples. But only his disciples. On the first telling of the parable the so of the soils, Jesus ends it with, whoever has ears, let them hear. The parable is left as a mystery with no explanation. Last week we said that the parables were to point people to Jesus, to who he is and what he had come to do, the bringing of God's kingdom and to elicit a response from his hearers. If you had just heard the parable of the soils, would you have understood? The disciples weren't really sure about why Jesus spoke in these parables, in riddles, which is one translation of the word. It's probably true to say parables cause confusion sometimes. In verse 10 of today's reading, disciples asked him, why do you speak in parables? Jesus' response is this from verse 11, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. He goes on in verse 13 to say, though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or understand. And then he quotes from Isaiah, you will never be hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's hearts had become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Later on in the chapter, Matthew gives his opinion on why Jesus spoke in parables and quotes from Psalm 72. He writes, Jesus spoke all these things to the crowds in parables. He did not say anything to them without a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. So why does it matter that Jesus spoke in these riddles and that to many they were not explained. We need to look a little at the context of both these Old Testament passages. So let's start with Isaiah. Isaiah 6, 9 to 10. Now this is a passage where God tells the prophet Isaiah to proclaim his word to a people who are deaf and blind to his truth. The passage is not a command, rather a prediction of what will happen to Israel because of their rebellion and disobedience. The sense here is because they had heard God's words, had been given ample opportunity and seen God's works, but to no purpose, and had hardened their hearts, would not learn, repent, or change. Their sin shall be their punishment. That's worrying, isn't it? Their sin shall be their punishment. God will still continue in his work and works, word and works. God doesn't give up, does he? But will withdraw his spirit so that they shall be as unable as now they are unwilling to understand. In simpler terms, many hear the sound of God's word but do not feel the power of it because they've closed themselves off. And so God is allowing that to continue. Time and time again, God's people are turned away from following God's ways and these words are spoken 
as a prediction, as a warning. According to James Montgomery Boyce, who I've not heard of before today, actually, <laughs> Psalm 72 is the longest historical psalm in the Bible. Its lesson is that history must not repeat itself. The people must never again be unbelieving. An unbelieving life means God's ways are not followed. Life is not lived to please, glorify, and honor God. Now, can we learn from the history of God's people? How are the parables being used to aid this? Something to think about. So we continue with the history lesson here. The people of God. In Genesis, we read that God created the world. Humankind rebelled against their creator, known, of course, as the fall of man. And God put a plan of redemption or salvation into motion, involving calling out to a people for himself to be a light for the, the, the nations, for the Gentiles, and entering into a covenant, sorry, entering into a covenant relationship with them, sometimes known as the Abraham covenant. He makes promises to Abraham that from him there will be a people who will have a special personal relationship with God who created all things and that people would be numerous. In, in our recent series on Moses, we saw the, how the Israelites were great in number. We saw God continuing to make good on his promises and saves them from slavery for life in the promised land. Of course, they complain, they rebel, they are scared, they lack trust in God. When they eventually get to the land, generations later, the pattern of rebellion and God saving repeats through the book of Judges. And then even when they ask for a king, because of course other nations had kings, it doesn't stop their rebellion. Even with the few good leaders, rebellion and disobedience are a pattern. The prophets are sent by God to warn that this rebellion will actually lead, what this rebellion will actually lead to. But God in his very nature saves and so promises that even through his people, even though his people will be taken into captivity, they will return to their land and there would be a promised Messiah who would fulfill the role of perfect humanity, living and trusting and obedient to God in telling of these parables, Jesus is pointing to who he is and the kingdom he is bringing. And just like in the Old Testament days, when some hearts were turned against God, there will be those in this day, but also due to the rebellion of their hearts, cannot accept and will not understand. So we're going to turn back to look at the disciples now. And uh, in this passage, though the disciples are blessed because they do not understand, sorry, in this passage, the disciples are blessed because they do understand. Remember, in verse 11, Jesus said, the secrets of the kingdom has been given to you. Jesus has chosen them. He's teaching them, revealing who he is by his example and doing life together, just spending all that time together. There are glimpses when his disciples get it, when they understand, and there are others when he has to patiently explain, sometimes again and again. What are those secrets? Those secrets are knowing who Jesus is, the Son of God, promised Messiah, who came as the perfect example of humanity, living in trusting obedience to God, to an intimate relationship. Those secrets are knowing that Jesus died, was raised to life for forgiveness of sins, to stop the cycle of rebellion against God, and to allow us all to have a restored relationship with God 
if we repent of our sins and live in full obedient lives in intimacy with him. Those secrets are knowing that Jesus ascended into heavens and rules God's kingdom now on earth, which comes about in the lives of his people and for eternity. Those secrets are knowing that Jesus sent his Holy Spirit to guide us as we read God's word. So we too are blessed with these secrets. As followers of Jesus, the secrets are also revealed in us through God's, through God's word, we can now know the power of the cross. We can know that we are living in the kingdom of God. We can know his guidance and receive his promises. God gave to his people. So Jesus spoke in parables, but for those who were of his kingdom, he promised to give understanding. Thank goodness. So from all of this, what are the main lessons for us this morning? Well, there are three lessons. We like to have three lessons. Um, for us, from this passage, which we'd like to focus on, and the first thing is this. Well, I think this passage brings great encouragement. It's shown us that those who are of this kingdom, he promised to give understanding to. For example, of the disciples, that was, that was a journey. People trusted enough, sorry, hang on. People trusted enough to get out of the boat and walk on water. Sorry, Peter, Peter trusted enough to get out of the boat. I should know that, shouldn't I? And walk on water. But then he lost his focus on Jesus and began to sink. One time, Peter acknowledges that Jesus is the one, the one Messiah, the anointed one, and then goes on, of course, to deny him three times. Peter was one who Jesus revealed the secrets of his kingdom to. And yet it took him time to get there. That gives us some hope, I suppose. <laughs> But he shared the truths of the kingdom with many other people. And so that's a great encouragement for us. When we have accepted who Jesus is, we are members of his kingdom. And if we listen, he will show us more and more of the truth of his kingdom and who he is. Second uh, lesson, it can help to lessen frustrations. It can be difficult or challenging when our friends and family are not understanding our faith, when it seems so obvious to us. Let's continue to pray that we will become open to hearing and understanding and to continue to sow the seeds of truth about who Jesus is and his kingdom. And the, the last lesson is about motivation. It motivates us to continue learning more about God's kingdom, God's rule, who God is, and why he sent Jesus, and how that leads to transformation in our lives. Not just our lives, but families and culture. Maybe you feel motivated to develop your prayer or your prayer life. Maybe you want to study the Bible more Bible study can be in groups, and towards the end of September, there will be new groups starting again. Maybe you're better on a one-to-one -one setting, and we could try to make that happen. Maybe you just want to get a regular pattern of reading your Bible at home, or it might be that you want to study more on the history of the Bible, or, or learn about Christian faith, or you want to read about people's experiences with God. There are books and podcasts we can point you to. There might be a life situation that you're going through at the, at the moment. I always remember, and I was all often grateful for when you open, especially some of the bigger or larger print Bibles, there's a part in there that you can go to if you're feeling a bit low, if you, you've got faced with a particular challenge, and there's lots of ideas, and it'll tell you the passages to go and look for. And that's been really helpful in the past. There might, um, sorry, there are many ways anyway 
that we can continue to learn the secrets of God's kingdom. And so, whoever has ears, let them hear and let them respond. Amen.